is still king. And uh, uh, if, if you're uh, visiting with us this morning, if you would just tear off this attachment on your bulletin and fill that out and then drop it in the offering plate later when it comes by. Uh, also, uh, Trunk or Tree is uh, this Saturday uh, from 5 to 7. Uh, if you're doing a trunk, uh, Sherry, around here, Margaret, you may know this. Do you know when they're supposed to be there for, for trunk or tree? Uh, no, it'll be 4 o'clock when you set up. Okay, they're asking that you be there at 4 o'clock to set up uh, for trunk or tree. So if, you, if you're doing a trunk. All right. Uh, also, um, Women's Craft Night coming up on the 26th at 6 p.m. And then uh, Margaret has some things she would like to share. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if you have a bulletin, you'll find in your bulletin uh, a bookmark about the shoeboxes, Operation Christmas Child, our Christmas shoeboxes that we're uh, constructing to be sent uh, all over the world uh, to children who would not otherwise have a Christmas. And this bookmark is to remind you to pray uh, about them. Uh, pray for the shoebox recipients, pray for the local churches that are participating, uh, pray for the Greatest Journey. They have a program called the Greatest Journey that the children have the option of participating in after they get their shoe boxes. And it is uh, the journey of coming to Jesus uh, as your Lord and Savior. And then pray for the volunteers worldwide. They have, I would say, thousands of volunteers worldwide that, that go through the shoe boxes and pray over them and, and get them where they are supposed to be. So uh, our shoe boxes are due November 7th. Once you get them filled, just bring them over here. And uh, don't forget, if you can, uh, to uh, give us $10 per shoe box that covers the shipping and handling that goes on all over the world and it helps pay for the shoe boxes that we have purchased for you. Um, the other thing I wanted to announce was um, our local ministry, we're going to be doing food baskets again this year. If you or someone you know needs a food basket, uh, you need to let us know uh, by November the 21st. You can tell myself or Phyllis or Joyce Lori. And um, the food baskets cost $75 a piece now. You don't have to pay that if you give us a name, okay? Uh, we do take donations for that. We do have a little bit of money uh, put back for that. Uh, but just to let you know if you would like to make a donation towards that, these will be going to people here in our community. So uh, if you know someone, uh, just be sure to let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Um, turn to 287, please, and uh, we'll be singing all these verses. And uh, let's stand as we sing. Him to be my Savior. 
Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always going to be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior's always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God, He's always going to be. Just living, dying, let me breathe. My strength, my solace from this grave, that he who lives to be my king, once died to be my savior, that he would leave his place on high, and come for sinful men to die, you counted strange, your once did I. with me to uh, page number 96, and we'll sing all three of these, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <clears throat> Lord, my hope 
chapter 8, John chapter 8 in verse 30. I don't know if you've had uh, individuals in your life that have invested in you and have given you advice. And perhaps they kept you out of trouble. They told you something that was really good advice and it kind of put you on a different path. Uh, maybe you know somebody. Uh, I remember one, one pastor telling another pastor he was struggling. He was been doing a lot of studying, but uh, just seemed to be kind of dry and everything. And and this uh, this this fellow pastor told him, he said, "Look, he said, when you get up behind the pulpit, you let Jesus speak through you." Amen. And it made a huge difference in his ministry. But uh, we've all had people like that in our lives that have made a difference. But you know, I'm con I'm convinced that the greatest person we could ever have advice from is Jesus Christ. And he has given us some very specific advice here in the scriptures we're going to look at today. Uh, that uh, it's very simple, but very practical and life changing if you follow it. We need to follow the advice that the Lord Jesus gives us. And that's the title of my message, Advice from the Master. And we're going to look in verse 30 of John chapter 8. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. We are descendants of Abraham, they answered him, and we have never been a slave to anyone. How can you say we will become free? Jesus responded, Truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. A slave does not remain in the household forever, but the son does remain forever. So if the son sets you free, you will really be free. I know you are descendants of Abraham, but you are trying to kill me because my word has no place among you. I speak what I have seen in the presence of the Father. So then do you, uh, so then you do what you have heard from your father. Our father is Abraham, they replied. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus told them, you would do what Abraham did. But now you are trying to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You're doing what your father does. We weren't born of sexual immorality, they said. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. 
Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Who among you can convict me of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? The one who is from God listens to God's words. This is why you don't listen, because you are not from God. The Jews responded to him, aren't we right in saying that you're a Samaritan and have a demon? I do not have a demon, Jesus answered. On the contrary, I honor my father and you dishonor me. I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it and judges. Truly, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Now, the scripture we're looking at here, there's a group of people who believe in Jesus. And so Jesus is giving some advice to them. And, and, but he's also arguing with some who are still opposed to him. And uh, as he argues with them, he is putting some pieces of advice in the midst of the argument uh, to, to help them grow in their faith if they will listen to him. Uh, and so uh, I think there's a group of people who are listening to him, and there's a group of people who aren't listening to him, and he's, he's addressing both. But what are these, these pieces of advice from Jesus? Well, first of all, he advises us to stay in his word. He advises us to stay in his word. In verse 31, then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples. Amen. What is a disciple? A disciple is a learner. Jesus said, if you want to learn from me, if you want to grow in your walk with God, you need to stay in my word. What does that look like? Well, I think it looks like the assembly of God's people for worship, for one. That is, you're hearing the word of God. I remember years ago when Sharon and I first met, and uh, we, were, um, we were actually married uh, shortly thereafter. Uh, we were going to a church, and I suspected that the pastor who preached at that church didn't believe the Bible. Now, I didn't know that when I went there, but I, I, I came to suspect that. And later on found out that it was true. But Sherry and I decided at one point, we're, we're going to go to a church where the Bible is preached. And so that's what we did. We went to a different church. And can I tell you, I recognized when I began to get back under the preaching of the Word of God, that I had drifted spiritually, being away from God's Word. Just to hear, it wasn't that I wasn't doing my quiet time, I was. But I had drifted from God, and, and there was, there was a, a, a distance between me and God because I wasn't where I needed to be. And when I got back under the teaching of God's Word, God helped me fix that and get back where I needed to be so that I could walk closely with Him. Uh, we need the teaching of God's Word. We need to hear the preaching of God's Word. Now, that's part of staying in God's Word. I believe that. I think if you are uh, doing that as a practice in your life, you will benefit from that in your spiritual life. I believe that with all my heart. If you bring your kids to hear God's word and you do that on a regular basis, they will benefit from hearing God's word. And it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the power of God's word. God's word has a power. And, and it is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And listen, I, I wanted my kids to find Jesus when I was a parent of, of young kids. And, and I would pray for that. But you know how kids find Jesus? They hear the gospel. <laughs> and, and where do they hear the gospel? They hear the gospel usually in the local church, right? So, so important. So stay in God's word. Now, you also need to do that in your personal life. If you have access to the Word of God, you're able to read the Word of God, I encourage you to do that each and every day of your life. Spend some time reading the Scripture. The Bible says, don't be conformed to this world. Don't become like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. So each day, I'm, I'm in this world, right? I'm being influenced by this world. But I'm also being renewed in the spirit of my mind. And God gives me a fresh touch of his presence and a, a fresh measure of his truth each day 
to kind of counteract the effects of this world on my life. Listen, I can't think of a time in my lifetime where we need that more than we need it today. We need God's Word. So, so stay in God's Word. God's Word will help you by helping you grow spiritually. It will confront you when you have drifted from God or when you're in sin. It will correct you when you're on the wrong path. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, the psalmist says. Don't we need that today? Amen. Wisdom for what direction to go? Clarity? Listen, we, people in the culture, they don't know anything. They have no clarity about moral issues at all. We as God's people have the truth. We have clarity. Why? Because God has given it to us in his word. The craziness of the culture. And it gets crazier every day. It seems like every week I hear something new. But I think that is just bizarre. But we have the truth. Listen. Teach your kids the truth. Spend time teaching them the word of God. Read the scripture to them. Get them a Bible story book and tell them the stories of God's word. Uh, but get them in the word of God. Make up a silly song like my mother did so that they can memorize a chapter of Scripture. D do these things because as you do, you will give your kids a heritage. This is Jesus' advice. It's amazing to me. Some people, um, their kids have no exposure to the things of God or very little. But they're exposed to the world and then they're surprised when they don't want to follow Christ. They're surprised when they go on an immoral path. Listen, if you want your kids to turn out right, get them under the teaching of Scripture. Amen. Right? All right. <laughs> Stay in God's Word. By the way, it's just a blessing. God's Word is a blessing. It comforts us when we're broken. It restores us when we're weary. It gives us hope. It strengthens our faith. What a blessing. <laughs> So stay in his word. That's advice no, number one. The second thing Jesus tells us, not only to stay in his word, but to turn from our sin. Look at verse 34. Jesus responded. They're asking, why are you saying we need to be free? Jesus responds, truly I tell you, everyone who uh, commits sin is a slave of sin. We need to turn from our sin. Sin. Now, this is a key to the spiritual life, the Christian life. Okay? You, we turn from our sin when we come to faith in Christ, right? It's called repentance. We make a choice to turn from our sin in our own way to follow Christ. That's a, a choice of faith that we make. But we also make a choice. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you've got to take up your cross daily. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. So it's a daily choice that we must make. And even more than that, I think it's sometimes it's maybe an hourly or every two or three hour thing. Uh, we make a choice of whether we're going to turn from sin, right? Why is that important? Though sin cannot make you lost if you know Christ, sin can steal your joy. Not only can sin steal your joy, but sin can also rob you of your fellowship with God. Rob you of the peace that passes understanding. Rob you of God's power. Okay? Uh, you get in a fight with your spouse, right? There may be a distance. Don't touch me, right? Uh, but you're still married. But the fellowship is broken. The same thing is true spiritually. When we sin, we break fellowship with God. And if we don't turn from that sin, we remain in a spiritual wilderness. The only way to have a vital Christian life is to have a regular practice of turning from sin. Okay? Hopefully we learn how to walk in victory in the power of the Holy Spirit over greater periods of time so we don't have to do it quite as much. But we've got to turn from our sin. If we're going to have any vitality, any uh, joy or peace in our walk with God, any closeness to God, 
uh, it will come when we turn from our sins. We also need to turn from our sins because sin leads to spiritual bondage, as Jesus has mentioned here. Now you say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not bondage to anything. Well, that's true in your position in Christ. And, and it is true. We have the power as Christians to live a godly life. God's given us the Holy Spirit. Okay? We can, by faith, take up the shield of faith. Uh, and we can walk with God. That is true. But it is also true if you give the devil a place in your life, he'll take it. And not only will he take it, but he, as he gets access... As you open your life through sin to the devil, he will begin to look for other places in your life that he can begin to wreak havoc. And the, the more you sin, the easier it gets to sin. The more you follow God, the easier it gets to follow God. There's a choice that we have to make each and every day that we live. Will I walk in sin or will I choose to follow Christ? Even as believers... And, and God is a God of great grace and mercy, and I praise his name for that, because I need that grace, okay? Uh, Romans 5 says, where sin abounded, there did grace much more abound, and we do praise God for that, and we thank God that his mercies are new every morning. But we also need to recognize that sin is a problem. It's a cancer. And it will affect not just you, it will affect others around you if you pursue it. A path of sin. So Jesus' advice is turn from our sin. Now in our culture, we need to know what sin is, right? We don't even know what sin is. Our culture's redefined everything. They have said, they've, they've taken marriage, and they've said marriage is no longer one man and one woman, as God said in the Garden of Eden, when he created Adam and he created Eve, and set the first couple up. Now they've said, well, uh, homosexuals and transvestites and all the, I mean, the, the LGBT, and they keep adding letters. I can't even keep it straight. And the moral compass is just gone. There is no moral compass. People in the church often commit adultery and live in sex outside of marriage before marriage when, just like the world, oftentimes. Now, I don't believe that's the case for those who are walking closer with God, but it is the case far too often. We have adopted the morality of the world, and we wonder why the church in America has no power. We've got to turn from sin. Listen, I'm going to tell you, our nation had better turn from sin. I'm just going to tell you, I love my country. I served in the military. I love America. I want to see America thrive. I want to see America do well. But if we persist down the path of sin that we're on, we're going to face increasing judgment. I believe we're already being judged. I believe it's going to get worse. Amen. Now, God has given counsel. He gave it to Israel. He gave it to other nations in the word of God. He said, turn from your sin. That's God's counsel to America. If America is to thrive and to be under the blessing of God, we must turn from our sin. But whether America turns from sin or not, we as God's people can choose to do that. We need revival in the churches across our land, but whether or not the churches humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, you can do that as an individual, right? You can have a personal revival even if nobody else gets in on it, all right? So this is Jesus' advice. It's Jesus' advice to the church. It's Jesus' advice to the nation, but especially it's Jesus' advice to you as an individual in your walk with God. If you want to grow in your walk with God and you want to have a vital Christian relationship, turn from your sin. All right? So stay in God's word. Stay in his word. Turn from our sin. We need to turn from our sin. We need to, thirdly, know our enemy. We need to know our enemy. Look at verse 44. You are of your father the devil. Jesus wasn't politically correct, was he? <laughs> you are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks 
from his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus gives us advice. Stay in his word. Turn from our sin. Know our enemy. Who's our enemy? Satan. What's he like? He's a murderer. He wants to destroy. Jesus is saying, kind of like Spurgeon, you know, the lady went out of Spurgeon's church after the service one day and she said, I didn't like that message. Spurgeon said, neither did the devil. Classify yourself. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, you are speaking against me. You're speaking against the truth. You need to classify yourself. You're of your father, the devil. But he is also giving a piece of advice. You need to recognize the devil for who he is. He's a murderer. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Those who follow after the devil, the devil hates them too. He wants to destroy them. You see, a lot of times people think, well, you know, the church just wants to take away all your fun. They want you to stop doing all the fun stuff, right? Not true. As we follow Christ, we find what life is really all about. Um, as we lose our, our lives for the sake of Christ, we find them. But what the devil does is he uses sin and he uses his evil path and his deception and so forth to destroy individuals. He wants to destroy their joy. He wants people to walk around empty with no purpose and no understanding of life, just drifting from day to day without any kind of real meaning. Uh, he wants to destroy people physically. I truly believe that abortion is satanically, or I believe it has an origin in Satan's purposes in our country. He wants to kill and destroy. And what is he doing? He's killing in the womb. He's destroying in the womb. Uh, but he doesn't limit it to that. Satan is also a destroyer of Christians sometimes. Now, he can't take away your salvation. But he can destroy you. We knew this, this young man. He was uh, walking with God at the time. And he, he sang in a quartet in our church. And ended up going into the ministry. And he was serving in the music ministry of a church uh, near where I grew up. And he got into an affair. And he chose to live a life of sin. His wife found out about it and confronted him. And he went to a parking lot and stuck a hose in his window and killed himself. Satan destroyed him. Couldn't take away his salvation, but he destroyed his life. That's what Satan desires. Uh, you need to know your enemy. He is not your friend. We're in a battle, and the one we're in a battle with plays for peace. But thank God, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. By the way, did you know one of the ways Satan destroys is through lies? He's a liar and the father of it. He is the expert liar, verse 44 says. This is so important. Jesus has already said to stay in the word. One of the reasons you need to stay in the word is you need for the devil's lies to be exposed in your life. Amen. Right? Oftentimes, we believe things that just aren't so. Maybe we hear them from the culture. Uh, maybe they come from our old sin nature, that we just believe these things, but we believe them in error. God's Word helps us discern the lies. What did Jesus do when Satan tempted him in the wilderness? Three times he quoted the Scripture. Because what was Satan doing? He was telling Jesus lies. He said, you need to, to fulfill this now rather than waiting for God's purpose. This is what's best for you, not what God desires. And he was lying to Jesus. And every time Jesus came back with the scripture, and one time Satan used the scripture to try to lead Jesus astray. And Jesus said, yeah, but it also says this. You shall not put your God to the test. You see, Jesus knew the scripture well enough to recognize the twisting of the scripture by the evil one. I want to tell you, there are people who will lead you astray and who are being used by the evil one. The scripture talks about, um, in the book of Daniel, uh, the prince of Persia 
and uh, you know the prince of Greece and so forth and, and about these battles that were taking place in the spiritual world that even though there are physical kingdoms on the earth that are coming against and, and uh, affecting the events upon the world stage that ultimately there are spiritual realities behind these events you need to recognize that there are spiritual realities behind what happens in the world. And sometimes the government becomes the vehicle for the Satan's lies. Um, don't just believe something because somebody in Washington, D.C., or anywhere else for that matter, just because they say it. Believe the Word of God. Stand upon the Word of God. So um, we, we see this deception. We see it in the, in the school systems across our land. I, I read this book uh, a while back. I read it before my kids went through college because I had heard about it. And uh, even though I didn't believe that what the, what the guy was saying was true, I thought, well, I'm gonna, I want to know what he's saying so that if my kids come to ask me about it, I can tell them what I think about it. And so I read this guy, and he, he's, a, he's a, a guy that studies manuscripts. And basically, he uses his discipline to destroy uh, the faith of Christian college students. And uh, as I read through it, I recognized that he was doing exactly what Satan was doing when he twisted the scripture. He was, he was twisting the facts to make them look a certain way. When the fact of the matter is, I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I may not look at the actual manuscripts, but I, have, I do have... Uh, manuscript information in some of my books and so forth. As I study the scripture, I look at that stuff. I'm going to tell you something. We have every reason to trust in the word of God. It, it's the most trustworthy book of history, of ancient history. There's nothing like it in history. You can put your trust in the word of God, but that's not what he said. You see, Satan has a program, and what he will do is he will take things, and he will twist things, and he will try to lead people astray. So, I mean, it, it's in the media. It's, it's everywhere you look at. And that's why you need the Word of God. Because without the Word of God, you don't have an anchor to expose the lies of the enemy. Don't let the world teach you how to raise your kids. Let God's Word teach you how to raise your kids. Don't let the world tell you how to do marriage. Let God's word tell you how to do marriage. Anyway, know your enemy. Oh, okay, so advice from the master. Stay in his word. Turn from our sin. Know our enemy. Follow his direction. Jesus advises us to follow his direction. Look at verse 51. Truly I tell you, if anyone keeps my word... He will never see death. Now this got them all stirred up. And we don't have time to get into all that. But what is Jesus saying here? He's given us directions. Right? His word. If we will follow this word. We will never see death. Now. You say well I thought everybody. One out of one people died. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Uh, the Bible says elsewhere, it is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment. So we all physically die. But here's the thing. If you know Jesus Christ, the Bible says in, in John 17, 3, this is eternal life that you may know him, the only true God, Jesus Christ, and your sin. The moment you trust in Jesus Christ, there's a new birth in your heart. A new life dwells within you. And I want to tell you something. Your physical death can't stop it. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Amen. And so we live forever through that spiritual life he gives us. But he says here, I tell you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. So what is he doing? He's connecting the enjoyment and the, the experience of that spiritual life to the obedience that we have to God's word. If you will follow my word, if you will base your life upon it, you're going to live the abundant life, right? Amen. You'll never see death. What, 
How does a Christian experience death spiritually? We can't, we can't lose our eternal life because it's eternal, right? So how do we experience that? It is when that fellowship is broken, right? Or also when we experience the consequences of sin. Both of those things are, are a death of sorts. Um, so uh, if we follow God's word, if we follow his directions, we won't see death. Now, there's a scripture in Proverbs 31 that talks about the blessings of the woman that fears the Lord and how God works in her life and blesses all the different facets of her life. There's a scripture in Psalm 112, I believe it is, that talks about the man who fears the Lord. And it talks about how his home is blessed, his wife is blessed, his children are blessed, and all the facets of his life are blessed. Why? Because he fears God and he puts him first in his life. This is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you will follow my word, you won't experience death. You, will have, you may have all kinds of chaos going on outside of, of, your, of your body, but in your heart will be the joy of the Lord. And God's presence will always be there. And his peace will be there for you as you seek him. I'm grateful that I can go when I get distressed or when I get anxious or whatever the case may be. I can go to him and I can find in the prayer closet as I thank God and as I ask for what I need, I can find the joy of the Lord uh, restored in my soul once again. But you can't find it if you're unwilling to follow God. Sometimes people say, you know, I know the Bible says that, but this is what I'm going to do. You're cheating yourself. Well, yeah, I know, I know that's what the Bible says, but I really think that this is a wiser course of action. You're cheating yourself. Well, I just really don't agree with the Bible about that, so this is what I'm going to do. You're cheating yourself. You're missing the life that Jesus desires you to experience. If you will follow my word, You'll never see death. That's a pretty awesome promise. Now, none of us in this life can follow that perfectly. We all sin. We have to confess that, repent of it, and so forth. But praise God, there's coming a day when we will. <laughs> well, that old sin nature is going to be removed when Jesus comes. And then we will experience the full, unadulterated, I mean, the, the spout where the glory comes out is going to be turned all the way up. And we are going to be under the fountain. And uh, we will experience our God like we've never experienced him before. What a day that will be. Amen. So, Jesus' advice, what does he advise us to do? He advises us to stay in his word, to turn from our sin, to know our enemy, and to follow his direction. And as we do that, we will be. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the first step of his direction for you is to make a decision today to uh, just admit that uh, you're a sinner before God. The Bible says we all are. And to make a choice to turn from your sin in your own way to follow Jesus. Uh, Jesus has made this eternal life possible because he lived the perfect life we couldn't live. He died the death we deserved at the cross and he rose again. And because of what Jesus did, when we repent and trust in Jesus, God says, and he promises that he'll save our soul. And so if you'd like to do that this morning, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that. And I'm just going to ask Elaine to, to play a verse of invitation. We won't sing, but just um, I encourage you to uh, respond to God during this, this time uh, so that you can have a relationship with Christ. And if you're here today and you already know Jesus, let me ask you, are you following this advice that we've talked about this morning? If not, come to this altar and tell God, Lord, I've not been following you, but I choose today to follow your advice. If you need prayer, I'll be here at the front. Uh, whatever God's leading you to do, you, you come now. Let's stand.